Hi folks, this is International Master Kostya Kavutsky, and today I'll be talking about the pawn wedge. The pawn wedge is really important, both strategic and tactical concept, and that is when, specifically, we get one of our pawns to the sixth rank. In this video, we'll be talking about pawn wedges on the squares f6, then we'll move on to g6, and finally h6. So, when you get your pawns to one of these squares fixed in your opponent's position, this can be not only a tactical asset, but also a strategic asset as well. And I'll be showing you guys a couple of different ways that this pawn can be a really powerful force in the position. Our first example here is a classic from one of the great masters of the past, Joseph Blackburn. And this game was played back in 1871. Now here, White has established a very strong pawn wedge on f6, and as you can imagine, this pawn, its main role is going to be in attacking the square g7 and setting up a potential mating attack. So White's next move here is hopefully very, very straightforward and obvious, queen to d2. Now White aims to put his queen on h6 and deliver this checkmate queen to g7. Of course, there's not much strategy involved. When you have a pawn on f6, you should try to get your queen to g7 and give mate. But the way the game plays out, I think Blackburn demonstrates a number of different attacking ideas here, which are quite nice. Black played the only move in the position rook e6, and his idea is that if White plays queen h6, Black is ready to meet this with queen to f8 and doesn't get mated immediately. Note that the sacrifice queen takes h7 here does not work in this kind of position after rook h3. Not only can black block, the king can also move back. But there is a very, very thematic idea here to keep in mind. If this king was on h8 and we can imagine a black rook sitting on g8 defending the g7 square, then white would have this combination available. Queen takes h7 check, followed by rook h3 mate. Very, very important tactic to keep in mind in these kinds of positions. But it doesn't work here. Instead, white played the move rook h3, and now he's preparing to play queen h6 with a double attack. Both g7 and h7 would be under threat. Black played king h8, which is one of the possible defenses. Queen f8 was also possible in order to try and prevent white's queen from reaching h6, in which case white would most likely play queen to g5, and white's idea here is going to be to play rook e to e3 and prepare the sacrifice rook takes h7. After king takes, white would come in with the other rook and would soon be delivering a checkmate. For example, rook a8, rook ee3, and white is already threatening to either take and follow up with the other rook or start doubling rooks on the h-file, rook h6, bring the other rook to h3, and eventually crash through on the h-file. And thus, white is giving mate. Just to show a sample line here, let's say bishop c4. Black doesn't really have a move to defend the king side. Rook takes h7, I believe is already working. Check, king g8, and the clincher, queen to h4. Black has no defense to queen h7 checkmate or queen h8 next move. So in the game, black played king to h8, queen h6, and queen g8, defending both g7 and h7. Now white pulls back, queen g5 rook e8, and white sets up the final phase of his attack, starting with rook h6, bishop c4, and really nice move, bishop c1. Now white is planning on bringing again the other rook to h3, and then taking on h7, eventually followed by a queen h6 check with mate to come. So black tried to play d4, white played rook e4, bishop d5, and the rook swings over to the h-file, now mate is inevitable, all thanks to this f6 pawn. Rook takes e5 was played, and white finally crashes through on h7. After king takes g8, white will play queen h6 check and queen g7 mate. It was actually king g8 was played in the game, and white was able to mate here either way with rook h8 check takes and the same mate on g7 actually occurred. So I just wanted to show this as the first example because this is really going to be the biggest achievement of getting the pawn to the sixth rank in front of your opponent's castled position is that it sets up all kinds of different mating ideas and mating threats. With that, let's move on to our next example.
Here, white has established a very, very strong pawn wedge on g6. And in this case, this is again leading to a very powerful attack for white's army. Now, later on, we'll be looking at examples where the pawn on the sixth rank, the pawn wedge, can actually play a strategic role, meaning that you won't always get some kind of mating attack, but you will get certain strategic advantages, specifically controlling the escape squares of Black's King, which long term often means that Black's King has issues with a back rank checkmate, for example. And this can often play a part not only in the middle game, but even in the end game as well as more pieces come off. However, with the pawn on g6 in this position, the main idea you should be looking for is figuring out a way to get your queen somehow, one way or another, to the h7 square. This is where white is going to be kind of banking his hopes in order to try and get a mating attack going. So this position actually came from one of my games, and I found the right idea to start, and that is the move queen to e2. Now this queen is eyeing the h5 pawn, and this is going to be our entry square in order to get into h7 and try to deliver a checkmate. Note that black's position here is really backed up as all the pawns in the center are blocking black's pieces from being able to defend the king side. So this is really uh, quite an extreme, extreme case. Now a natural move here would be knight to f8 in order to defend h7 and put some pressure on the g6 pawn, but this actually loses spectacularly to the move knight to g5. A very very nice sacrifice. So black is more or less forced to take the knight, otherwise white will play knight to f7, queen takes h5 and give mate on h8. And after fg5, hg5, the point is that white has now opened up the rook on the h file and queen takes h5 is now going to be threatening queen h8 checkmate. Bishop takes g5 is one reasonable move and after queen takes h5, white's attack is simply crashing through. For example, bishop h6 takes takes and here white can take the h6 pawn i believe it's even stronger to push our pawn with g7 just clearing the route and setting up a checkmate in just a couple of moves so after queen e2 this idea of knight g5 and taking on h5 in this case caused black to panic rightly so and black tried to somewhat bail out with the move knight takes c5 this is a sacrifice, the point is after dc5, black plays e5, attacking the bishop, and if white was to make a slow move, like a move like bishop g3, black would play bishop to g4 here, in order to prevent white's queen from getting to the h5 pawn, and establishing a very very firm control over the center. In this position, I think black would actually have pretty reasonable compensation for the piece, as white's attack would all of a sudden be stunted. Instead, white is able to win with a nice combination here, starting with the move knight takes e5, giving back the piece in order to be able to swing our queen to h5. After f e5, queen h5, bishop f6, white plays the very strong move bishop to g5. And now white is starting to come in with queen to h7 check. Black's king isn't getting mated immediately, but all white needs to do is open the position up a little bit more and black's king is going to be in serious danger. For example, bishop to e6, white can play f4, and if black takes on f4, white takes with the bishop. This bishop is going to swing to the d6 square, controlling the escape route of the king, and then queen h7 will be a very serious threat. If black doesn't take on f4 and plays a move like e4 instead, we can imagine white can crash through with a sacrifice like bishop takes e4, takes, knight takes e4, threatening to take on f6, and then followed by queen h7 check and g7. White's position here is pretty much overwhelming. So, to sum up, when you do get a pawn lodged on the g6 square, or for black the g3 square, you do want to look for an immediate way to get your queen over to h5 and give potential mating attack on h7 and h8. Our next example again shows the g3 pawn, this time from black's perspective, and this comes from a king's Indian defense where we often get these pawn chains where black is launching this enormous attack against white's king. And in this case, black's entire attack relies upon the strength of the g3 pawn. Now here playing black, the great attacking player Nezhmedinov found a really stunning combination starting with the move knight to g4. 
and his idea is pretty similar as in the previous game. If white takes this knight, then black is able to open up the h file and is going to be able to crash through and give checkmate to white's king. For example, king g1 here is possible, queen h4, and black is simply crashing through and will be giving mate thanks to this pawn on g3. So the knight is more or less untouchable. White played the move h3, which seems pretty sensible in order to try and keep the king side closed. And here comes black's second idea, queen to h4. Now black is preparing to eventually sacrifice this bishop on d7 on h3 in order to open up white's king and again deliver the checkmate on that h2 square. Queen to d2 was played. Black hops in with the knight, knight e3. And now, regardless of what white does on the next move, black is planning to sacrifice bishop takes h3 in order to open up the king and give checkmate to white. So, for example, any move like bishop takes e3 or knight takes e3, black ignores this piece, will simply take here as the queen and the pawn on g3 are too strong, and this is just leading to mate. So, in the game, white played bishop to d3. Pretty sensible decision in order to try and open up the queen on the second rank so that the queen can defend against the immediate mate, but this was not good enough. Bishop takes h3 was played anyways, gh3, and now g2 check. And black's pieces are clearly just crashing through here. The game did not last much longer. White played king g1, black captured the rook, invaded with the queen, and after knight h4, I mean, white could already resign in this position. Black is threatening to take the bishop. Black is threatening knight takes f3 check. And, I mean, the game is more or less over. White just had no defense from this point. It seems like black's attack was extremely strong thanks to the power of this pawn on g3. Our last example for this lesson is going to be showing you guys the power of getting a pawn all the way to the h6 square. Now here in this position, the player playing white definitely has a strategic advantage. His bishop on d6 is very strong and supported by the strong pawn on e5, and it seems like white is controlling a majority of the board. So this move h4 is, is a very nice idea, and the point is to try and get a little bit more space and try to create another weakness in black's position to really stretch black's defenses to the maximum. Black was not able to really do anything in order to prevent this plan and has to shuffle. So rook a7, h5 was played, rook d7, rook d3, queen a8, and now queen f4. For the moment white keeps the queens on to increase his attacking chances. Queen d8 was played, and here comes h6. White lodges this so-called thorn in black's position, and this pawn on h6 is going to make black's king very, very uncomfortable. In the game, black played bishop h8. In case of bishop f8, white would simply double rooks on the d file. And if black trades on d6, eventually the position is going to collapse. For example, in this position, after rook takes d6, the queen has to stay in touch with the f6 square. Otherwise, white will come in with queen f6 and give this mate on g7. And after queen e7, white can already start collecting pawns with rook takes b6, and it is just dominating the position. This is one of those cases where not only is the h6 pawn a tactical asset, it's also kind of a strategic asset as well. Now black can never have his pieces leave the back rank because of this threat of back rank checkmate, meaning black's pieces are going to be passive for the rest of the game, which makes black's defense rather hopeless. So in the game, black had to keep the bishop on h8, and obviously this bishop on h8 is just a dead piece. This is just another strategic asset of the pawn on h6. You can often imprison a dark squared bishop on h8, which makes black's position really, really bad. So let's see how white was able to convert his advantage, because the position for white looks very nice, but at some point you still have to break through and win the game. Queen a8, queen e3, queen d8, black is just shuffling, and white starts his plan and he moves along very, very slowly since black has no counterplay and can't really prevent white from pushing on the king side. And here comes f4. Now it becomes clear that white wants to start pushing g4 and f5 and try to open up black's king. With full control over the d-file, white can basically take his sweet time and black won't be able to do anything to stop it. Queen a8, rook d2. White is just shuffling. 
and slowly making progress. Queen b7 was played, and now finally white elects to trade queens as he is in a very favorable position to do so. Rook takes b7, and here comes white's breakthrough with f5. Now, white's idea here is actually to push his pawn to f6, and then to play bishop e7 and invade with his rooks on d8, setting up this inevitable back rank checkmate. So black is in really, really deep trouble here. He can take on f5. But if he takes a second time, then rook g3 check is simply ending the game. And of course he cannot take on e5 either because once again we see the pawn on h6 playing a very very important role. Black is just getting back rank mated. So thanks to this pawn on h6, white has all of these different back rank mate ideas and black's pieces remain extremely passive. Black tried to break free with f6, I think this was a good practical decision, but ultimately falls short. Really nice move here by white, g5. <laughs> I really like this breakthrough. The point is, whatever pawn black takes, white is going to get one of his pawns to f6. So if we take on g5, white plays f6, and this bishop is simply dead. White is going to play bishop e7, rook d6, next move, take the e-pawn, and the game is just lost for black. Essentially, white is playing with an extra bishop at this point. Black played f takes e5. White pushes forward with f6. And again, this bishop on h8 is simply done. In the game, e4 was played. Rook d2. e3. Rook e2. This pawn, of course, is not going anywhere. And <laughs> black just has a hopeless defensive task in front of him. Finally, a very nice move to finish off the game here. Bishop to c7. Can't take the bishop because rook on d8 is hanging. Rook takes d5 was played. Cd. Rook takes d5. And rook takes e5. So the position has opened up a little bit, but black's bishop on h8 is so entombed that even as more and more pieces come off, black's position actually becomes more and more lost. So black actually resigned here. The reason is after rook takes e5, if black doesn't trade rooks, then white is just going to give check and pick up the bishop and win the game. And if we do trade rooks, then the pieces that are left on the board are essentially a king for each side and an extra bishop for white. So white will just play bishop c7, take all of black's pawns, and black's bishop will never see the light of day again. Of course, black will at some point just have to sacrifice, but the end game is completely lost and there is no point in going on really. So... I hope these examples today kind of illuminated you guys some of the key ideas of having a pawn wedge on the 6th rank, especially in front of your opponent's king. I'd say in most cases, the biggest point of doing this is to create very serious mating nets and mating patterns against your enemy king. But there are also a lot of cases where the pawn wedge serves a very strategic role, specifically restricting the opponent's pieces and always putting the threat of this back rank checkmate into the realm of possibility for the enemy king. I hope you guys do some good work on the exercises as this will help your retention of the material. And until next time, this was International Master Kosti Kavutsky signing off.